The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Hey, Kara Oosterhuis here with realagriculture.com. It is time now for another Wheat School episode. I had the opportunity to catch up with Tom Wolf of Agrometrics and Sprayers 101. Tom and I talk about spray drift. We all know it exists, but how can we combat it? And what sorts of things do we need to know about it? Check out the conversation now. Yeah, I mean, drift remains perhaps, you know, the biggest ambassador of agriculture in the sort of the modern era. You know, people, people see sprayers and they worry about drift and they, they, you know, agriculture is cast in that light. So it's really our responsibility, not just for downwind targets, but also really for the image of agriculture as a whole to minimize drift whenever possible. So it's a really important issue. I mean, it means a, it's a loss of product on the ground, but it's also a pollutant once it's off target. Now, obviously, you have done a lot of work when it comes to drift and written lots of different things. What what are still some of your main points when it comes to drift? Yeah, drift remains actually quite confusing because there's a lot of sort of counter acting forces, you know, like, for example, we always think about wind and drift. And of course, wind wind's really important because the windier it is, the more small droplets will leave the spray cloud that the sprayer produces and move off target. That's a loss. But on the other hand, what happens to it once it leaves? You know, in that, in that sense, wind can be your friend because wind actually actively creates turbulence in the atmosphere and it dilutes the spray cloud that you've lost. So its impact downstream is actually not as bad as you might think. It goes up and not so much across. Now, does it depend on product to product, how much wind you actually can handle, or is there kind of a rule of thumb across the board on wind speeds? Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think that it does vary from product to product, and it's only because of, of two things. One is different products atomize differently. So you might spray a, a herbicide, fungicide, insecticide that has certain formula, a certain formulation that actually creates finer droplets. And, you know, for example, the big example in, in our world is Liberty. Liberty atomizes very finely because it does have a lot of t- detergents in it. And so it, uh, it makes fine droplets and those are harder to control than some other formulation that doesn't do that, even at the same wind speeds. So that's one thing. The other one is really, uh, you know, what is the active ingredient and what's downwind? Because, you know, a drop of any given size will drift the same distance regardless of what product's in it. But the question is, how much harm can that drop cause? And so now that depends whether you've got a group two and you've got canola downwind, or you've got, you know, a group one and and you've got flax downwind. Uh, Different bad things happen. And I think everybody has to assess those separately. Another important point when we're looking at drift is inversion. And I know inversion is one of those things that a lot of people kind of cringe at because it can be confusing, it can be complicated, and sometimes there's not always hard and fast rules. Do you want to elaborate on inversion for us and the impact it has on drift? Yeah, you know, when we say don't spray when it's too windy, the obvious thing is to wait for when there's no wind. And of course, if we do that, when when does that happen? It happens later in the evening, maybe earlier in the morning, maybe overnight. So that becomes then the go-to time period for spraying. And we all know that growing up, we sprayed early in the morning to avoid the wind and we stopped spraying when it got windy. Now, inversions are things that happen when it is when it's actually calm. <laughs> and that's too bad because we also have to shut that door. The reason inversions are dangerous is because inversions are are characterized by a stable atmosphere. In other words, that turbulence I talked about doesn't happen. So the spray drift that does leave the spray cloud, and there's always some, just by forward travel speed alone, even if there's no wind, there's gonna be a plume that hangs behind. What happens to that plume? In an inversion, that plume stays put, and it moves slowly off target with some small wind or maybe with with slopes. And when it gets to its destination, it might be a quarter mile or even a half mile or more away, it's still concentrated. It hasn't dispersed and separated. So it can cause a lot of damage there. It just kind of lingers. And so what we see is square miles might be affected by an inversion incident and they might be damaged equally. Whereas if it was windy, you'd probably only see the border area of that section damaged. So, you know, you have to balance those things. 
Now, when we're talking inversion, of course, lots of us hear about delta T. I'm not even going to try to explain it. That's why we have the expert here. Tom, can you elaborate? Yeah, you know, we've had a bit of a dry spring. Of course, we've had some rain, but it has been generally dry. And so people are concerned about sort of the lifetime of droplets. We've been advised not to spray when it's too hot, for example. And really the best measure of, of droplet life expectancy in terms of evaporation is delta T. Delta T is the dry bulb temperature, so the normal thermometer, minus the wet bulb temperature, which is a thermometer that has a little wick of, of water soaked cotton around the bulb. And so the evaporation cools that wick and lowers the temperature of that thermometer. So the larger the difference between those two temperatures, the drier it is, and that's delta T. So if it's really, if you have a high delta T, let's say eight or 10, that means the droplet is likely to evaporate to dryness in seconds. A lower delta T, it'll last a little longer. And that's important because of two things. One is uh, pesticides are typically not taken up that well when they've dried onto the leaf. They're taken up quite well when they're, when they're still wet. So we want to preserve life time on the leaf. And secondly, the droplet can evaporate significantly and shrink in diameter even between a boom and the ground, even just the second or two it takes evaporates quickly and then becomes more drift prone, maybe critically drift prone and moves off target. So that's, those are the main two reasons we, we, we're concerned about that. And do we have any solutions to this problem? You know, yeah, there, there is. I mean, the, the solution to the problem, the easiest solution is really droplet size control, right? So that's why we've really been talking about those larger droplets. And lately I've been thinking about newer nozzles. And there are some new nozzles that are dicamba specific. So dicamba, obviously a bigger product in the U.S., but still important here, uh, must use extremely coarse to ultra coarse sprays to be legally applied, even in Canada. Those nozzles are typically too coarse for us and we haven't really considered them as general purpose nozzles, but they can get you out of a pickle on a windy day. So if you have the choice of spraying on a windy day versus a calm morning, choose the windy day and use a low drift nozzle like a dicamba nozzle. You might lose a bit of coverage. You might not get quite the efficacy. You might lose five or 10% efficacy, but you're gonna get the job done and downwind the wind disperses whatever does drift, it doesn't cause damage.